All right, welcome back to the second stage of our Jovian campaign. Now, we have Battle Group Melbourne and Battle Group Perth, which we have formed out of our two sets of battleships uh, out of last episode. The Sydneys and the Melbournes have split up into two forces to hunt incoming. What this means is I now have considerably more freedom to make more intercepts. I've got three intercepting units rather than the previous one which makes the odds of any alien getting into the Jovian system considerably worse than they were before. Battle Group Jupiter is a couple of days from its intercept, but we can do better. Uh, at the moment, I have my eyes on Victor 51, a group of two destroyers, Eternal Storm class, which is, we don't know. We don't know what weapons are on the Eternal Storm class. There you go. And Vic, uh, Victor 46 is an Eternal Storm destroyer and a Boreal Wind class frigate. Both are incoming due within a couple of days of each other. So, of course, Battle Group uh, Perth will engage one threat and Battle Group Melbourne will engage the other. The group with the two destroyers is slightly more dangerous, so we will intercept Victor 46, uh, which is the destroyer and the frigate, using Battle uh, Group Perth, which is the smaller of the two forces. That will cost us 126 uh, KPS. We will intercept on the 9th. Battle Group Melbourne will intercept the slightly more dangerous force as it has three battleships or rather battle cruisers uh, and it'll set intercept on the fifth as basically as soon as this force hits orbit before it gets to the station so we'll be catching it right on that approach i think if you look at the intercept windows that have been drawn on the map there you can barely see the point where it enters orbit before the intercept is made so we will hit that transfer so that means we have three intercepting forces out on target uh, Transferring, transferring, transferring. Victors, two, so two, four. So we've got two, four, six ships that we are currently targeting for interceptions. So we're just going to up the tempo. Same thing as we were doing before, but now we're going to be trying to intercept even more fleets as they come in using all of these battle cruisers, using their speed and their DV, um, their DV supplies in order to make as many intercepts as possible. Bring it on, alien scum. While all this is going on, we've unlocked Mission to Saturn, and we get to hear the head of Exodus throwing shade on other billionaires. Fantastic. Uh, what am I going to research next? Outer Planets is a definite option. Um, this will allow us to go out to Uranus, Neptune, and more importantly, we're going to need this eventually just to be able to send stuff out to the Kuiper Belt to attack our enemy. But it's not a super high priority. I feel like... Um, Interplanetary polities and everything from a rival governance could be very, very useful. Uh, designer life forms, invasive. I don't know what any of this does, but helping the planet seems like a right idea. We'll just keep it on a low priority, finish it by 2040. Uh, and over here, uh, I could give myself even more defense against enthrall, but my plan is to eliminate the last Hydra operatives instead. All right, Battlefleet Jupiter has the first catch of the day. Victor 21, we have two. Uh, in terms of raw firepower, relatively weak frigates, but they're both mounting plasma batteries, which means no fancy maneuvering head on to the pass. They don't have enough firepower to get through the front. The plasma battery instead of the missile launcher is a big upgrade, even if it actually lowers their combat power, because we can stop missiles pretty reliably with our double point defense phases and laser engines. We can't stop plasma. So we will engage, we will bid their entire budget. They didn't spend all of their Delta V this time. We're going to accelerate a little bit, bring our ships closer together. But for the most part, we are just going to go head on. A little bit of a burn here from the Scourge, just to bring it in closer to the Hades. And the priority target will be the Falling Sword first. See the plasma rounds coming in. Now, plasma is less damaging than coils, so we should be able to tank it with our front armor for a while. Uh, but it does mean we're guaranteed to take some damage. Of course, we will want to mount plasma weapons of our own in turn. And you can see, working together, their point defense um, is doing a pretty good job. Priority target the Falling Sword. Um, is doing a pretty good job of engaging our rail rounds as they fly in. So perhaps we should close the distance. I think we got the firepower to engage. As long as we keep the prow pointed towards the opponent. That's one. It's times like these I'm very glad I brought phases. Because as you can see, against these lightly armoured vessels, sometimes that's what you need. And other times what happens is the phaser knocks out their PD 
and then a rail round, get a coil round, gets them. So while I've got additional uh, Melbourne class ships in construction, this will probably be the last generation that uses these sort of weapon configurations. I want to move over to a new generation of ships, but in the middle of a war, there's no time to transition. I don't have the next generation engine I want yet, uh, and I don't have the time or resources to spend on the really large hulls that I want to get creating. But either way, Battlefleet Jupiter, with one damaged and one operational, chalks up two more kills. Uh, on Falling Sword and Cresting Wave, 4.9 exotics in the bank. I love it. Uh, Jupiter will now, BF Jupiter will now coast to Ganymede orbit. It'll arrive on the 22nd and then become available for its next intercept with 700 KPS still in the tank. I love these ships. On one hand, the AI are coming for your white collar jobs. On the other hand, well, there's an alien invasion on and we kind of need it for the war effort. Plus, we'll find other jobs. There's always space in humanity first, military arm. I know Battlefleet Jupiter is destroying ships, but Max's work removing the last Hydra agents from the planet is also important. That's one of two gone, and I believe Sahiba should be surveilling the final one. There may yet be more. It's possible that we've missed uh, and haven't identified all of the Hydra agents, but eliminating as many as possible makes me feel just that little bit safer about having my growing grasp on power suddenly yanked away. I've also pulled Nero and Vincenar off advisor duty right now. I just need all hands on deck, uh, building up public support, fortifying points. There's a lot of political maneuvering happening and they can go back to advising later. Victor 40 is probably the next engagement target for Battlefleet Jupiter. It's four ships. Victor 138 actually arrives sooner, but there's only two ships in the cluster, so more important to intercept 40 on its way in. Uh, we can catch it on the 16th or the 25th. I'm going to go with the burn and catch it. I can afford to burn it out of Delta V. 180 is their lower limit, so let's catch it before it actually gets to the planet itself, and then we'll coast in. It'll just make me feel a little bit better. Uh, plus, we may gain control of our ship just a little bit later on, or earlier on, rather. I'm wondering, yeah, we'll do that. We'll do that. So all three fleets have now been designated with targets. Victor 46 and 51 um, are allocated. Victor 40 is now allocated to be tasked by Battlefleet Jupiter. There remain some untasked incoming fleets, but we're handling as many as we can. Not that Earth is immune to aliens attempting to infiltrate agents as we eliminate them. Let's make the intercept with Sydney. We can auto-resolve that. A little bit of damage is okay. 2.2 exotics and presumably a dead Hydra agent. I'm happy with that. Battlefleet Terra can handle the repairs. So the Sydney remains a critical defender of planet Earth in the absence of its kin. Other ships are being constructed. That They're just not ready yet, frankly. This one should be complete overkill. Melbourne, Electo, and Harrow with their superior point defense against alien ships that only have mag cannons and missile bays. These are not the new generation ships with plasma cannons. This is Victor 51 and all the fleet. So we're going to engage, we're going to bid, and we're going to destroy them. I'm not even sure I need to show this one. I think it's going to be pretty one-sided. Quite the disco lights show. Not even close. And by now you know how this works. If there's still sufficient Delta V in the tanks, well, then we're going to make interceptions. Victor 61 is another Whispering Veil class dreadnought with a single uh, destroyer as escort. So vulnerable by itself, um, but dangerous if allowed to be in a larger group. The Melbournes are well suited for countering something that primarily depends on a mag rail armament because they've got even more laser firepower than normal because their hull mounted weapons are also phases. So they are allocated and set to engage. We're basically point defending the system at this point, and so far it's working beautifully. Perth and Desolation have created, have found Desolate Grave, Boreal Wind. We will engage, burn the KPS, which I think leaves them with basically nothing in terms of the ability to maneuver. So let's just see what Auto Resolve does to us. Okay, it damages both of our vessels, but destroys them. I'll take it. Uh, I will generally be fighting these fights, but I'm, I was interested in what the auto-resolve would give us. The Anzacs are back and refreshed, reloaded, so they're on their way now to Four Vesta to take out the base there. Then we'll repeat the process for Indina. I'm considering actually building another Anzac-style fleet, these Raiding Force Marines that are designed to hit undefended bases. I'm timing this so that Victor 80 should not be there at the time that we arrive, but if they are, Victor 80 is welcome to attempt to intercept. The Anzacs are going to have more than enough KPS to evade them and then continue their mission anyway. 
lock in a course for low Vesta orbit. All right, this is the most difficult one we faced for a while, but it's also in some ways the simplest. Obsidian Fortress and Falling Moon have 256 centimeter violet laser cannons. Black Whirlwind, Sea Flower, they're mounting the standard mags and missiles, which means Black Whirlwind and Sea Flower basically can't hurt us. They don't have a critical mass. So if we kill the two laser boats and go head on into them, we should be okay. Both fleets are willing to fight, so we don't need to burn their Delta V. Let's go. In this one, the dangerous ships are definitely the gunships. These things are basically flying lasers. They look like they're flying top cover, if such a thing even exists in space. So what we're going to want to do is padlock them and then accelerate. So what I'm going to do is tighten up the formation slightly. Put us on, actually no, I'm going to, we're going to burn off to the side, sure, but then we're going to equalize pretty quickly. We're going to priority target one of the two gunships, probably this one. Done. They're flying into us, which is good. And then the key is going to be prow towards the lasers. Don't stress about the destroyers and the secondary ships. Only the gunships really matter. Okay, they are engaging us. So I want my nose pointed directly at that gunship. These missiles, mag rails, we can handle it. The one thing the gunships don't have is immense protection. Hades looks like she's taken some nose damage, and we've lost the nose-mounted phaser, which is a problem. PD is holding up. Scourge, are you engaging them as well? You should be. I want one of those. There we are. Okay, Magrail got a hit. Magrail got a hit. So now we want to engage the Falling Moon. Come on, I'm hoping this coil round hits it. No hits, bugger. We're going to take padlock off because we're probably going to end up having to go into a pursuit profile. So we engaged the gunship successfully, but now we've got the destroyers that might be running. And only one nose-mounted phaser with which to engage them. We'll accelerate, but they might be able to break contact here. If they choose not to double back, I don't think I'm going to be able to catch them. I'm having to neutralize my velocity basically down to zero before I re-accelerate, so unless they choose to engage again, we're probably not going to get them. Let's see if they do. That's promising. Give me a second, let's see how they fly. It looks like at least one of them has decided they want to go again. Not sure it's the choice I would have made, but apparently they still think they have a chance. Reality is, of course, they don't. Their weapons will not get through PD. So let's unpadlock and engage the second. I think this might end up being a clean sweep. as long as we climb into their plane successfully, and then level out. Uh, yep, I'm going to have to rebalance here. And start getting velocity going in that direction. Overall, I think we've got a bit, a bit insane with the upward velocity, but I will fix it. This is basically an advanced gunnery exercise, with the guy flying by at high velocity while our mag rail gunners try and get the target pipped. I think it was Scourge that finally made the hit. I'm a bit disappointed by the damage to Hades, but other than that, we've cleaned up four ships, and our only loss was the damage to the 480 centimeter and some damage to the nose hull integrity. That basically suggests a through armor crit. Your armor doesn't protect you 100% of the time. You can get critical damage through armor, and that unfortunately lost us the phaser cannon. Uh, okay. So 20 May until you hit your temporary orbit, and then we'll be able to readjust you. Um, you still get your acceleration though, so I'm not too worried about you. Yeah, you'll hit, a you'll hit a temporary orbit around Jupiter, and then we'll be able to repoint you towards Ganymede. Scratch four. 
Perth has now filled the tank, so they get a chance to intercept Victor 61, which is a Dreadnought plus a Destroyer. Uh, Jupiter is flying back to low IO orbit, and Melbourne is intercepting Victor 28 in just over a week's time. High tempo operations indeed. Uh, meanwhile, on planet Earth, Ireland is shortly to be integrated into the European Union, cleaning up one of the last bits of territorial claims that we needed to organise for the EU before we could begin the process of federation and eventually unification. As we said, 61 is a Dreadnought plus a Destroyer. We will engage, bid, close and eliminate the target. I'm only really worried about the... Actually, no, it's only a light laser battery. I'm really only worried about the spinal magnetic cannon. If I can eliminate the lighter ship first, I will. Otherwise, that destroyer, uh, sorry, that dreadnought is a juicy target. One thing I've noticed about the alien dreadnoughts, they've got basically no armor on them. Nine forward, but only two on the flanks and rear. So if we can get to the side, uh, the side armor of this thing, well, it's not going to last particularly long. Keep in mind, we have 80 forward armor roughly on our dreadnoughts. Well, sorry, on our battle cruisers. Let's engage. Perth and Desolation. Looks like the Dreadnought is up front, so I'm actually tempted to engage her first. Since that ship is inside, what I'll do is we'll pass on the starboard. That's probably a bit too extreme. Something more like this. With a then circle around like that. That should do the job. Nice and close, mutually supporting PD. Primary target is the Obsidian Fortress, which is a heck of a name. The battle does start, I think, at a little bit of a longer distance because it models the fact that they're going to want to start firing their long-range weapons. In their case, their missiles and their spinal mount. So now I'm going to swing around and do something like this. Our cannons may be intercepted by their PD. But as you can see, we're close enough to be mutually supporting, so their missiles shouldn't be a problem. But I'm pretty sure human point defense phasers, especially boosted by advanced laser engines, are in fact superior to alien lasers, at least the non-exotic versions. After all, phasers are an exotic using weapon, it makes a degree of sense. The ocean wind has closed the distance far more, so we'll engage her, and we will point the nose at the target to make the most of our nose-mounted phasers. I suspect that the PD and the hull mounts will be enough. Otherwise, we're going to point towards the target and then we're going to burn uh, and get in close. The Dreadnoughts don't like being up close. So now that the nose is pointed for me, what I'm going to do is go in for the kill, I think. Heavy burn on a trajectory that will clearly take us into knife fight range where our lasers can do work. Because their point defense is handling our incoming mag rounds, or at least most of them. But it can't handle all of them. Scratch another capital. That's a lot of resources just going boom. Wish the Anzacs would hurry up and take out another mining location though. Do I get any exotics? Hans Castillo would like his exotics. 1.7. I'll take it for Scratch 2. Um, the metal and everything income is obviously completely inconsequential, but it is what it is. Um, and as you can see, we intercept them just as they hit Ganymede orbit before they rallied with anyone else. A uh, couple of hours, we will be able to redirect Battlefield uh, Fleet Perth towards its next intercept. 874, still plenty in the tank. Melbourne, Electo, Harrow, Meat, Riparian, Dawn, Holy Victory, and Vast Sky. Vast Sky is a dreadnought of the type we've seen before. Holy Victory is probably the most dangerous ship out there, despite her low tonnage, because she's got a big-ass laser battery. We will engage. We will bid. We will submit, and we will fight. Okay, so once again, we've got Melbourne spawning far ahead, because when I designed the Melbourne, I miscategorized the type of ship she was, and as a result, the Electo and the Harrow are convinced they are transport ships, and I have not yet found a way to alter that. So we'll put them both on this sort of trajectory off to the side. While Melbourne doesn't move particularly quickly, we'll accelerate Melbourne at the last moment. Because until they're in closer range, Melbourne's PD is essentially alone. That said, they will build up speed relatively quickly. 
In fact, they should overtake the Melbourne in relatively short order. Let's swing them around towards the Melbourne. Although it's definitely holding its own so far as point defence goes. These, these phaser boats, these phaser boats, you just cannot scratch them with mag rails and missiles. And this is part of the problem, I think, of relying on missiles in the late game. Like, yes, you can, but you would need, you would need a lot of missiles. Um, I'm going to point the nose at Holy Victory and Padlock because she's engaging at relatively close range with phasers. And Electo gets a different target, engages the Dreadnought. Okay, everyone engages the Dreadnought. At these ranges, we will cut through the very little armor that's there, like a knife through butter. Burned right down. On paper, these ships have as much firepower as us. They, they kind of do. The problem is they've got the wrong sort of firepower. They're bringing missiles and mags against ships with top-tier laser weapons, boosted by laser engines and a massive PD array. It's just not going to work. So, Battle Group Melbourne chalks up a win. Only 0.41 exotics on that, but three more victors destroyed. I don't know if you're keeping count at home. I'm not at this point. I'm just trying to keep up with the incoming. Ireland has been reintegrated into the European Union, meaning it's time to clean up, or at least start cleaning up this border gore and replace it with a good, proper, humanity-first directed megastate. Ten days of diplomatic cooldown on executive consolidation in the European Union means after this turn, we can send people to start federating the Eurasian Union and the United Kingdom. The question is, what direction do we federate? I think we have to federate EU into the UK, I'm not sure if we can then federate EU... Anyway, I'll do it in the order it has to happen, which is the EU has to federate the UK first, and then we'll go from there. If you're wondering how the alien fleet strength is doing after this continued campaign of attrition, you can see there's still an awful lot of incoming. In fact, they've even directed more incoming towards Ganymede. The number of ships has fallen slightly to 94. Combat power has fallen from 33,000 to 28,767. So they're building through some of the attrition, but certainly not all of it. At the moment, we are wearing them down. We're still massively outgunned overall, but I've got time to breathe, and that's a good thing. Plus, we're holding our stations. As more mines in Jupiter come online, our resource income should increase. If we look at our Jupiter stations, none of those mines have completed yet, and they're all colony mining stations with very significant outputs. So if we have time to bring these online, we should be in a good position. I may even consider laying more. Never can be too careful. Ah, fantastic. We've got two Melbourne-class battleships come online. I'm actually going to send those to Terra, uh, because I think Earth could use some reinforcements. For the moment, at least, Jupiter seems to be doing okay. Um, so far as their next technologies go, I think picking up super heavy UV phaser is a good option. Um, we have... A long-term investment would be something like independent commands for 15% reduction of MC for our fleets. That's definitely an option. I don't think we have any other immediate requirements. Probably the impro improved heavy plasma as we continue working our way towards the heaviest stuff. So let's pick that up. 23 July. Not bad. I shouldn't have to do this, but I will. A few more resources will help, and this sort of keeps them going. They don't have much left, but they managed to stabilize their economy. It's now volatiles that they're negative on rather than water, so I'm not going to donate them any more water, but I will get them out of their deficit. They're not running a major deficit anymore, but they are overall negative, so I'm going to bail them out. Well, Britain is back in the European Union in 2039, so it just took us a while, and Task Force Anzac is ready to hit the Holy Victory base at Vesta, deploying five days to get in and get out. Hopefully, no, well, there's no alien fleet in situ to attack us, but hopefully none arrive and intercept us, um, and that should be good. I'm building another set of Anzac vessels 
uh, of the Anzac type of vessels, the Super Emus with the Solaris upgrade. I'm building more of those around Earth so we can hit more than one base at once. The next challenge, assuming we're able to continue securing Jupiter, that is we're able to keep the alien fleet off balance, is to build ships capable of neutralizing enemy stations. That probably means siege type vessels. I don't have the resources right now, nor do I have the engine that I want to power them, but I'm working on both. I'm also working on the weapons array, so we're probably not going to start constructing them until 2040, but I'm working on all the critical inputs. For now, I'm just happy with the fact that things on Earth are progressing, and that we're keeping the alien fleet off balance. Time is on our side, as long as we can keep up this tempo. And damn it, looks like there was an alien fleet present, and not nothing either. Whispering Veil class Dreadnought with 997 combat power. So of course we are going to invade, uh, we're going to bid 498 kp, in fact we're going to bid 500 kps. Both fleets spend 498.3 to evade. Now, my question is, okay, so I'm now temporarily unavailable for combat operations until 953. Does Victor 179 have enough fuel to get back to base? Well, f I guess we'll find out at uh, 943, which is also when Victor 179 becomes available for operations. So let's just click on the... I must admit, either they've constructed a new ship... I just don't want to miss a minute. Oh, I'm pressing the wrong button. Okay, so Anzacs are available for operations. I'm not seeing any movement by Victor 179. At all. Is there anything incoming in the next five... Victor... Okay, so Victor 181 is going to rally with Victor 179 in a day, and it has 400 KPS in store. As unsatisfying as this is, I think that the days of doing unescorted runs with Anzac is over, because here is what's going to happen. 181 is going to arrive and is going to dock with that fleet. It's then going to decide it can't move, and it's going to separate. They fixed that bug, I believe. It's then going to try and engage us, because it's got 260 combat power, we have 74. If we evade again, we're barely going to have enough to get home. But we might have enough to get home. So here's the question. If I run him out of uh, KPS as well, what will that leave me with? 100 to get back to Earth? I can deal with that. Assault the hab. Uh, and if we have to evade again, we'll evade again. We can crawl back to Earth, I reckon. So this will be him intercepting. No, it'll be confirm assignments on Earth. Okay, so we'll go back to that in just a moment after I handle Earth. Um, as I said, uh, the European Union has federated the United Kingdom. Uh, the unification can happen at the end of this year, which means what has to happen right now is the UK needs to get as much cohesion as possible. Five months at 0.3 cohesion a month, 1.5. I don't think that's actually going to be enough. I don't think that's going to be enough. We want to get the cohesion of the UK above five. I believe the higher the cohesion, the less chance that bits like Australia and whatever break away. But we'll see how we go. Now, my real question is, can I federate... The European Union into the Eurasian Union while the European Union exists as a thing. I actually don't think that's the case. And can, and can claims go in both directions. So I may not be able to unify the Eurasians and the Europeans for another six months. Because I'm starting to think, looking at the way this, this is structured, right? The correct, the correct gameplay decision and, and other factors may trump gameplay, is to unify the European Union into the Eurasian Union rather than vice versa. Because the Eurasian Union has a democracy value that is one like 1.1 higher. Like it has the superior democracy value. We could unify the other way around, but this is the better stat to inherit for the whole the whole massive blob. So we'll see. 
I'll probably play one more cycle and then make a decision. Um, but I am, I'm not certain that I can federate the EU into the Eurasian Union if that's what we want to do while we're waiting on cooldown to absorb the UK. Okay, that paid off. The other fleet has not gone for the intercept. Uh, so I can send the Anzacs straight burning full speed back to Space Adelaide. Don't stop for anything. 5.2 weeks. Light your engines. Go, 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 boys. Go, go, go. All right, now back to the handful that is Earth. Well, here's something a little bit different amidst all the war and conflict. We've had the first child born in space. An astronaut above <laughs> aboard ABBI Volatile has successfully given birth. All parties involved are by all accounts in good health. It is planned to transfer the newborn to Earth as soon as uh, practicable for long-term medical reasons. Imagine that life in outer space. Well, that's kind of cool. Well, our first IO mines are operational and I have to say the yields, especially in the metal types, is glorious. Uh, 4k base metal a month is much closer to what we're going to need in order to build some serious ships. At the moment I'm building ships only intermittently and partly it's because I need to spend all my metal getting the economy to get more metal. Uh, also converting away from nano fa uh, facts towards say an antimatter and exotic space money economy is also going to help. I'm steadily shutting down more and more nano factories in order to make that transition. Uh, although one problem that has begun to surface is we're starting to hit the um, ex the point where if you control too many, if you have mines on too many different objects in space, the requirements of managing the, the mag launchers going in all directions leads to a scaling cost in mission control. Now, I don't think my mines on these other bases are active yet. So I don't think my Callisto mine, for example, is online yet. When it becomes online, it's going to cost an absolute fortune. And I believe the same is true. Let's see if I have a mine active already uh, on Europa. Which makes me wonder whether or not the mine, one of those mines should probably be shut down. The other thing that I'll probably have to do if I start running into mission control issues is I'm going to have to think about turning off or abandoning low yield asteroids. I've got a couple of asteroids out there that still just have very, very basic. We look at humanity first, bases, inner belt. So things like Verse and Geteric Space. This is the one that we took from the resistance. It produces volatiles, but I don't really have a volatile problem. Shutting this down, I think, for example, yeah, see, lowers our mission control cost by four, not by two, because we take away the negative two penalty, uh, while at the same time also shutting down the mine. If we do that, this base is shit enough that it's probably worth abandoning the whole thing, shutting it down or giving it to someone else. Speaking of giving it to someone else, let's see quickly how our friends and allies are doing. In terms of resources, everyone is basically screwed. Uh, the Protectorate is still neutered, the Servants are still neutered. The Initiative is doing reasonably well, except for the fact they're running a negative on Vols, but they're doing positive on everything, everything else. Um, unfortunately, we're sort of at war with them, otherwise I would love to buy some of their metal from them. Now, the Resistance does have a pool of metal that I could buy, so too does Exodus, but they're massively over their mission control cap, which is going to be a problem for them, and they're running negative on boost, sustaining this negative volatile income. So trading volatiles to Exodus might be a great way to get ourselves a giant infusion of additional metals, if I could find one of their counsellors. Um, the Academy doesn't really have much worth buying. Maybe I could buy some of this metal, but really you can see at this point we have eclipsed all the other factions, and if I can seize the remaining nations through some um, technologies but also some unifications, I should be able to shut them down almost entirely. Battlefleet Terra is now a little less lonely in the sense that it's not just the Sydney anymore. She's been joined by Darwin, Hobart, and Canberra, bringing the force of the home fleet up to four operational battlecruisers. That should be enough, except for the fact that, well, 
there are other motherships out there that are apparently either... I'm not sure if they're going to combine with Victor 80 or whether or not they're going to form their own fleets, but it looks like there are more threat vectors out there. My mind is turning to potentially building the sort of force that could kill a mothership. Um, that's certainly something we could do. It's something we could build if we're willing to spend the resources on it. I just need to decide whether I want siege ships designed and capable of taking down enemy bases or ones optimized to kill enemy motherships. Just a thought, leave it with me. I also have a few more technological pieces I want before I build either of them. That's always the way. But I'll let the resources run up and the scientists do their thing. We are at 19.7k science now. People ask how it's so high. 143.6 from nations, I believe. And that's without any advising bonuses. Right now, India is producing 1.4. Uh, it could produce more if I brought the unrest down and advised it. The Eurasian Union is producing 1.1, European Union 225, UK 132, and the United States of North America is producing 1.3. Put that together, you get a nice national contribution. But twice that amount is being produced from HABs, and then because I research everything at once, I get all of that national income basically again in bonus income, 149.2 uh, additional daily income for research distribution bonus adds up to a nice monthly total of 19.7k. Awesome. Now Max is trying really hard to complete, compete with the body count of the battle fleets. Um, I don't think he's going to be successful, but he's trying. This also reminds me that uh, once we finish upgrading all MC stations, which is one of the reasons why we've dropped to 454, I think I've got about 10 or 20 in construction. Um, that's going on right now, we should build a couple of bombardment type ships that are designed to give us the high ground and bombard targets from orbit wherever there aren't surface to space defences. Um, I'd like to be able to rain some hellfire down on some servant and protectorate nations, so building a couple of bombardment ships is relatively cheap and easy to do. In fact, I might go design one now. Alright, this says it's easy, but I'm not going to trust the auto resolve with it because these things have plasma cannons. Um, and as a result, unless I keep the nose pointer at the enemy, I'm worried that they're going to get themselves into trouble. So the usual sort of thing happening, we're going to split off one force to the side. And I'm actually going to burn sideways to sort of bring it all together. Although we need to turn it, we probably need to turn in sooner, like then. Because facing away from them for too long just invites plasma to the flank, and that's just not a pleasant feeling. See, there it is. So let's burn into a more aggressive attacking posture. Rotate in. We should be taking the hits on the forward part of the Melbourne. Yeah, Melbourne's taking all these hits on the forward quarter. We'll swing her in so she can engage as well. Plasma cannons do have range. But for the moment, that 80 forward armor is tanking well enough. Whereas if this was auto-resolve, I have a feeling we'd end up getting hits on our side armor and we'd be in trouble. The Silver Fortress, um, none of these ships are particularly well armored. It's one of the reasons why their combat power seemed low. And with that relatively low level of armor, we should be able to destroy them even with our basic phaser arrays at long distance. I say basic, they're the best you can get, but, you know, they're not meant to be armor-cracking weapons at long distance. Alright, Melbourne should be able to destroy Resourceful Star as well. And then it's just a case of moving out and engaging Striking Hawk in the back. which means both of these ships can afford to be in a more attacking posture. Because, yeah, she was never going to um, survive that pass. Alright, Striking Hawk is not long for this world, and she's gone. Looks like she actually had some mag weapons, but they didn't get a chance to engage. So, Melbourne did take some damage, but another 2.1 exotics in tow. Uh, we will hit Ganymede Orbit in a couple of days, 13 August, we will hit Ganymede Orbit, and again, it is back to the shipyard for repair and refuel. A uh, little bit of damage at the front quarter, as you can see, but the ship is generally in combat shape, or combat-ready shape anyway. 
Now, just as I said, the home fleet was back up to strength, a reasonable strength at three battleships. I'm reducing it to two again to attach the Canberra to Task Force Anzac so it can continue its base raiding mission despite the fact that the aliens have quite smartly now assigned defensive ships to all of their um, asteroid-based mining stations. So I don't think there's a target I can hit anymore that doesn't have a defensive fleet, whereas before there obviously was. So now it's about picking a target. Where do we want to go next? I'm considering flying out a little bit further. We've cleared 92 Undina. No, we haven't cleared 92 Undina. That was the one I was considering doing. Okay, so that is exactly what we will do. We will fly to 92 Undina, and then we will let 219, let's save a little bit of KPS, because we might need it, get there in 6.62 weeks. Um, we're relying on the Melbourne to be able to engage the ships that are there. I think it can. I think it can successfully engage the defensive fleet and allow the Marines time to do their job. Godspeed. We're just digging their mining stations out of the inner belts, but until we can design and uh, build a couple of siege vessels, clearing their actual stations is, well, frankly, it's a bit too much for us, but we're definitely making progress. The waves on Jupiter are starting to slow. They have been replaced with a new series of reinforcements. They're heading towards Ganymede and some towards Earth orbit, but most of these Actually, no. It looks like some of these are... And a new mothership. Great. Okay, so... I, I mean great sarcastically. So, our two defensive battleships now have their own problems incoming. I really want to retire the Melbourne and Sydney class, so I'm going to see if I can hack together an improved design right now and build a couple more. I'm going to need them. They're arriving in March 2040, December 2039. Interestingly, I noticed that there's some assault carriers, of all things... Yeah, there's some assault carriers going to Ganymede. I don't know what weapon set an assault carrier has, but I'd be sending those to Earth, not to Ganymede. Anyway, constant flow of newly produced vessels going to both Earth and Ganymede orbit. This one's not going to arrive until 13 January 2041, so they're definitely committing to the long-scale campaign, convinced that they're going to be able to pull it off. If we look at their overall fleet strength... They're actually back above 100 ships and they're at 36,000. So they have more than replaced all the losses we have caused them so far. They have more than replaced them. So I'm going to have to outbuild them a little bit more and fortify more of my locations. That means I think Earth needs a few more battleships. I'm confident Jupiter can defend itself. The Jovian system has enough battleships functioning as battle cruisers to intercept all the incoming. But another Doom Fleet in Earth orbit right now would be bad news. So I'll see what I can design and construct. The Auckland class is a nice twist on the Melbourne and Sydney series. Uh, once again, the primary difference is what you mount in the heavy weapon slot. This time we brought in the heavy plasma battery Mark III, which gives us a 1,000 kilometer range with a 35,000 muzzle velocity and 15.3 damage. This thing should give us the ability to more easily swat small ships at long range, where phasers have trouble with armor and where rails have difficulty hitting. I think throwing two Aucklands into construction around Terra is probably a good idea. Our second group of marine transports is now ready, forming Task Force Hobart with the Hobart battleship in escort. What we're actually going to do here is send it to 1173, this asteroid out here, because by the time we arrive, we'll be in a position to both raid the base and then actually probably refuel in Jupiter rather than the asteroid. I'm not entirely sure, but I'd like to eliminate this base. So off we go. So now we have two task forces on our way to destroy mining bases for the aliens, clearing them out of the inner system, at least in terms of resource production. The long conga line um, is a problem. Oh, it looks like Victor 80 has decided to go all the way back to Marke Marke orbit and has ditched its motherships. But there are two motherships here that are separated off and are trapped probably for Delta V efficiency and are traveling separately. And there's a third mothership that's going back. I'm not sure what exactly they're doing, but I feel like everyone going back to Marke Marke is a bit of a problem. So we may get a triple mothership doom fleet, but a single isolated mothership coming to Earth, that's a potential opportunity. Let me build up a little more metal, build some more ships, and then see if I can build something to crack this thing. Maybe I can get some nukes. 
Battle Fleet Jupiter continues its critical work, chalking up another incoming Dreadnought. Awesome. For the record, if you're wondering why picking apart their fleets as they transit into Jupiter isn't putting down their combat strength, it's this no series of notifications here. On the 20th of August, they finished a ship in Vesta. 20th of August, Blue Mountain Station. Another one in Low Vesta. Another one in Low Vesta. So let's have a look at let's have a look at Low Vesta orbit right now. Two fleets, Victor 212, which is probably freshly completed. And Victor 214, was being Ah, oh, this is the Dreadnought. So the other ships must have already left. But there you go. So the Dreadnought is apparently stranded until they can figure out how to refuel it. I believe there is a patch that's going to allow ships to transfer fuel to each other. Um, but for the moment, uh, this is a stranded vessel. It's only good for local defense, and I am fine with that. Their fault for spending all their fuel. AI doesn't do it most of the time, as we've seen. They burn almost all of it, and they have enough to fight in combat. But this one, this one's done. So if we're going to keep up with their production, well, we need to produce our own ships, which we're doing. Three Aucklands are in construction right now, along with a special treat for orbital bombardment. So four combat vessels in construction. But we also need to destroy vessels. So this destroyer, this gunship with a laser, two of these have lasers, so let us engage Perth and Desolation. We'll bid, we'll engage, let's go. The tempo must continue, otherwise their still very superior economy will overwhelm ours. We can out-macro them, we're humanity, we've got a big planet, a lot of money and resources and crew, which means we can eventually support more stations, but those stations are only coming online now. Plus, I'm pretty sure that when I get antimatter, I'm going to be able to break the economy in, the sort of, in a fun way. But for the moment, we're still vulnerable. So engaging and destroying their space assets is the name of the game. Burn off Axis and then rotate before the lasers can do significant damage. We do have some side armor, so at this distance the lasers will barely scratch the paint. Um, and their lasers actually, I believe, have less range and penetration than ours do. By virtue of the fact that humans' uh, laser technology is superior. Now, our mag rails are going to have a really hard time hitting, but we're going to attempt it. I'm going to continue the Tokyo Drift at the moment. The Obsidian Sword looks like it's going to be punished for its hubris. I will designate it priority target, and I'll put the nose on to make sure the phases can be used. Perfect. Now, I think the, the Autumn Dawn is too far away. I was going to say the Autumn Dawn is the ship with the better weapons, so I want to engage it. But we want to kill the Stone Fortress first. Let's just slow it down so I don't panic seeing all the missiles and tracks come in too quickly. Love it. Final primary target is the Autumn Dawn. I'm going to come off padlock in a moment so that we can maneuver. Whoops. My fault. There we are. I think if we just hook, we should be okay. Get our relative positions right, and then go back to a padlock. The closer we get, the more effective our phases will get, but I'm hoping that eventually one of these mag rail rounds will get through. And I keep calling them bloody mag rail rounds, they're coil gun rounds. And once again, the phaser turns out to be the MVP, despite the fact that it's a bloody two-slot nose weapon rather than a four-slotter. Looks like Perth took a hit. Where did Perth get hit? Perth's radiator's a hit. That's a real... I wonder if that'll slow her down. Both are damaged. Destroyed, destroyed, destroyed. The temporary orbit is fine. We knew that was going to happen because we're catching them in deep space. So what'll happen is we'll hit a temporary orbit on 2nd September. I think she can make it back without her radiators because she's got a heat sink. Um, and she can usually radiate some heat even with your radiators damaged. But that's going to... I wonder if that'll slow her down. Let's find out. Either way, chalk up three more kills. I'll go to the top level map. Oh, by the way, this is uh, this is my thought for the mothership. Um, I figure with the right kit, I want something with a nice 
big salvo size. I think it's the Harlequins that give you the three three shot salvo, so we'll research the Harlequins as well. Uh, a couple of monitors mounting a mix of Harlequins and nukes should be an answer for those um, unescorted mothership fleets. So once we research the missiles, I might pump out a couple of monitors. They're relatively cheap. They'll be relatively quick con to construct. And I figure a collection of maybe six or seven of them, um, I'll do some testing, should be enough to introduce the aliens to the concept of atomic weapons. Now let's see if my ships are okay. Do I have anyone burning in against Victor 50? Victor 50, do I have anyone tallied to intercept Victor 50? Yes, I do. Okay, never mind. I was worried for a moment. So we want, where will we? Battle group, we will battle group Perth. We'll find out about Battle Group Perth in a moment. It looks like I'm going back to Earth. So it looks like Battle Fleet Perth was not too uh, damaged to make the burn. It's going to take them a little while. They'll take most of the month to get back to Io, but they will reach it in time to get repairs. So a relatively happy ending to the story, all up. Meanwhile, around Mercury, the first hints of our grand plan to finally destroy the alien invaders has begun. The super colliders of Annihilation Station the first of many that will be constructed around Mercury, have begun. They're now producing 0.7 units of antimatter per month. The cost for running the station is, well, it's significant, but it's not that significant when compared to other things. Uh, this station is costing us 970 cash and a whole bunch of other resources per month, notably 70 fissiles and 142 of each metal. But we can handle that. And in exchange, it produces us 0.7 antimatter. One antimatter sells for 45,000 cash per unit. So every two months, we can generate 45,000 cash and have 0.4 units of antimatter left over if needed. Plus we can sell exotics. This is why I haven't been selling my fissiles. I want to convert as much of possible of it into antimatter using super collider modules. I also want to establish a station to gather it in the Jupiter system for free. These are going to be the new nanofactories. No more nanofactories for money. Instead, we're going to produce antimatter. We're going to sell some of it to fund our operations, but the rest we are going to weaponize. The best reactors, the best engines, and some of the best weapons are gated behind antimatter production. And now we have some. I feel like this is a great opportunity to cut the episode. We've got ships being built, we've had a number of engagements, we're generally holding the aliens back, but their fleet is expanding faster than we can destroy it, at least so far. But we have ships in construction too, and now we have antimatter in production. The war is just going to ramp up from here, but so far at least in the economic war, I think we're keeping pace. See you soon.